Echoes from the Eons, Episode 3, Making Dinosaurs Beautiful. Produced by the National Dinosaur Museum, Canberra. Think of a dinosaur. What comes to mind? Is it the long, whip-like tail of the Diplodocus from BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs? Is it the blue-striped Velociraptor from Jurassic Park? Maybe it's a famously short-armed Tyrannosaurus, roaring out its dominance from almost every film to feature dinosaurs. Most of us come to the understanding of a dinosaur's physical form through their representation in the media, through film and cartoons, video games, books, comics and textile prints. But these forms aren't just manifestations of creativity. And while some popular depictions take more creative liberties than others, they are based off a real and tangible evidence of genuine creatures. So long before drafts are drawn up for the next blockbuster action film, how is the form of a long-dead life form figured out? What is the relationship between art and the sciences, and how does that art, particularly paleo art, function today? Illustrations of dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures has been a key aspect of paleontology and study since the earliest beginnings of the discipline. Unlike scientists researching modern animals, who can comfortably resort to photographs or live studies of their subjects, the only way to conceptualize extinct life forms is through art. The relationship between the two is therefore extremely interconnected. One of the earliest artists to attempt to bring these animals to life was Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. His drawings and sculptures, some of which famously remain on display in London's Crystal Palace, would almost be unrecognisable from the dinosaurs we are used to seeing in our modern reproductions. These representations truly are beasts, lumbering and cumbersome lizards of immense size and comical proportions. Hawkins' work quickly became outdated, as discoveries in America drastically accelerated our understanding of dinosaurs and their diversity, but it is still an important first step in the public and visual understanding of their kind. His work, displaying dinosaurs as sluggish and evolutionary failures, was not an accurate representation of the animals themselves, but came to be an accurate reflection of the early attitudes towards dinosaurs. Interests in creatures like dinosaurs and in producing art around them was sorely lacking in the first decades of the field. It would be several years before the discipline was no longer looked down on or considered inferior. There were, of course, other artists producing newer work, building on the increasingly new information and from the existing visual language provided by the likes of Hawkins and growing fossil record. Rudolf Zallinger and Zdenek Burian are two of the most prominent of these artists, producing some of the most recognisable work up until the 60s. Again, their work would become outdated, problematic, as our understanding shifted with time. But they left a mark on the collective imagery of dinosaurs that was a fundamental inspiration for many of the great paleoartists and paleontologists in the years to come. This process is still ongoing today and will continue into the future, always changing and improving. There will be a time when elements of the art produced today can be pointed out as wrong. In words of popular science author and avid collector Brian Switek, this is a feature, not a fault, underscoring the importance of art not only in expressing science, but providing fodder for debate over how our knowledge has changed. It was also around the 60s that dinosaurs began to appear in the developing world of popular art. Dinosaurs in fiction have accompanied film and animation almost from their creation, easily captivating the imagination with their majestic size, peculiar features and their surrounding mystery. With dinosaurs taking root in the public consciousness, museums and universities began to change their own attitudes, becoming more positive and engaged in both the fauna of prehistory and what that meant for our place as humans. This hunger for visual content in a public setting was not without its own drawbacks, however. The liberties taken with facts, or the absence of evidence, for the sake of drama or action impact, have left the public with a flawed understanding of the realities surrounding dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. While iconic films like Jurassic Park, or more recently The Meg, may misrepresent their subjects, what is important is the way that this sort of popular media generates interest. Though as an introduction to the topic popular media may be problematic, it is still an undeniably important element to helping build and grow a wider community of artists and researchers who are prepared and are excited to delve deeper. Having a visual point of reference for an area of study cannot be overlooked. From simple diagrams to complex illustrations, visual aids are an integral part of record keeping, education and research. Technical drawings will follow strict conventions that allow the subject matter to be easily understood by the viewer and may appear very confusing to a person without the appropriate contextual frame for viewing it. For example, when a fossil is sketched out in a line drawing, certain features are emphasised or brought forward. 
The point is not to sketch out a perfect replica of the fossil in question, but to present the relevant or important information in a clear-to-interpret format. Another, perhaps more familiar example of conventions, is in botanical drawings, where again the aim is to draw attention to distinguishing features. Illustrations in botany often represent the plant in all stages of its growth and development. If you were to look at a botanical study of a rose, the bud, open flower, wilting flower, seed and shoot may all be present in the same picture. This is not how a rose bush would naturally grow. The flowers will also need to face more than one direction, scientific studies requiring both a front and a side view. Likewise, a leaf should be drawn cut across to show its thickness. Collating these stages of development together in one form allows a person to associate all possible visuals of the plant, helping them to identify a real plant much easier than if they had only seen one of its life cycles, or perhaps many stages but mixed up with others. This also allows room for easy comparisons between plants that may only be visually different at a single stage. This kind of all-in-one illustration can help to show the way in which shape may transform over time, and references are easily written to accompany the various components. As with reproductions of fossils, not all features visible will be recorded in the botanical illustration, only those important or relevant for the particular purpose. For example, when botanical illustrations began, they were a guide to help doctors identify ingredients for medicinal use, and the medically important features were given more extreme focus. Technical drawings are invaluable, but they are a foundation. These drawings, no matter how precise, will not be the ones to capture the popular imagination. While they are often beautiful in their own right and take considerable skill, they tend to be lifeless and clinical. It is one thing to admire the representation of something that is, a fossil or bone, no matter how well presented, and another to be able to imagine the thing that was. Moving beyond diagrams and technical illustrations, we pass into the realm of paleo art. It is no simple task to flesh out an extinct creature no one has ever seen, using fragments of skeletons and constantly developing theories. Creating these reproductions is accompanied by many challenges. The soft exterior parts of an animal are the least likely to fossilize, and it is those that the artist aims to recreate. They must build the body up, constructing it from the inside out. Bones and skeletal form first, often with precious little hard evidence to start with, before moving up through flesh and muscle to fur, scale or feather. There are many different approaches and methods to these constructions. Some take the form of simple pencil drawings, inked line art or watercolours. Others may take advantage of photography, overlaying position skeletons with layers of shape and matter in order to preserve correct proportions, or use polarised photography to exclude the glare from fossil surface. Many artists will rely on the skeletal reconstructions of other experts as a foundation to work upon. Today, digital drawings and animated renders are on the rise, sometimes accompanied by negative attitudes about the supposed ease of the medium, but are no less finicky or challenging to perfect. Whatever methods the artist does choose to employ, they must always draw upon many varied sources, and while they have greater stylistic freedom than other areas of science art, they are still constrained by conventions and patterns if they want the end result to be considered academic or suitably accurate. The quest for accuracy has developed with the field over time, and attitudes surrounding proper paleo art have also changed. The desire to represent dinosaurs as realistically as possible resulted in some very stagnant tropes and styles. Common scenes would include hunting or drinking, but these were often the same few poses repeated to reflect only the most agreed upon options for behaviour and form. Gradually this has come to shift towards a much more lively and interpretive area of art, depicting dinosaurs or other prehistoric creatures in a much more diversified series of behaviours and locations, such as courtship and play. This change, starting in the late 60s, moved to create a visual record of live animals. Looking to the behaviours of contemporary animals of similar environments, size and adaptions, inferences can be made about their potentially similar habits and activities. Expanding the world of paleoart to include more hypothetical representations is much like presenting a new theory or idea, but conveying it visually rather than through a report or paper. Broadening this scope can encourage new directions or areas of inquiry for researchers to pursue. Using modern animals as a frame of reference to help render the potential form of a prehistoric creature is not a recent development, nor is such comparison confined to art alone. Looking at extant animal anatomy is a core base for any kind of paleo-art reproduction, and comparisons drawn from living animals 
were used from the very beginnings of paleo art. In the early 19th century, many imagined reconstructions of dinosaurs ended up looking like huge versions of the frogs, lizards or kangaroo forms their artists had based them off. With a more complete fossil record and a better understanding of anatomy as time went on, these aspirational forms could be refined and tailored to suit a more realistic potential body type. As we better came to understand the way muscles and ligaments fit over differing bone structures and how their size and distribution can be reflected in the bones that bear them, also helped to improve the overall form. By studying the way vertebrae connect to the skull and the pelvis, posture and stance can be determined. Comparing the colours, body coverings and adaptions of similar animals in contemporary environments that match the subject can help narrow the options to use in a reproduction. Some features that did not fossilise well, such as horn or cartilage, may be absent from the skeletal remains, but can be inferred based upon conclusions drawn from comparative biology. This can be especially important when the subject material is particularly scanty. It would be impossible to create an earnest visual reproduction of an extinct creature from which only a handful of bones remain, using exclusively those components as a reference. Comparisons must be drawn, where possible, with known related species, then with those from an equivalent ecology or dietary niche. Keeping the visual representations of these animals as current as theory can be difficult. Many museums and institutions lack budgets to commission paleo art, and the recycling of old images has cemented ideas in place that are scientifically and artistically dated. One of the most prominent examples of this struggle surrounds the colour and display features of dinosaurs. The choice faced by the artist is whether to illustrate based on theory or just evidence, and finding a harmonious balance between the two areas of discourse. In the late 2000s, fossilised evidence of dinosaurs sporting feathers came to light, and had one of the most dramatic influences on the attitude to paleo art in its entire history. Feathers are exciting for a mixture of reasons, but artistically they present a special range of new visual opportunities. Until this point, most reproductions were forced to rely on dull greens, browns and red scaly skin colours. Only crests, specialised plates or frills could be flushed with more interesting colours, but on the whole, the visual vibrancy of dinosaurs depended on pattern and shape alone. Feathers introduced a new world of potential textures and colour. The word feather will likely produce a fine flight feather in your mind, strong central vein in the middle with crisp fibres shooting off to the side. This is the most advanced kind of feather and the most recently developed. There are however different types that vary in function and structure. The simplest kind of feather is a loose unstructured tuft. Moving to long shaggy single strands such as seen on emus to more structured feathers with a central vein. These types all came before the more complex flight feather. Dinosaurs would have enjoyed these less advanced varieties rather than taking the crisp kinds we are used to seeing on birds today. Although feathers have only been identified on theropods, it is still an important stage in the art history. Not only are the physical textures of feathers diverse, but the way they produce colour is different between groups, and looking at the feather type, it is possible to narrow the spectrum of potential colour options as well. As with many other types of art, getting involved in a professional sense can be difficult. Often professional paleo artists will have some form of visual art qualification, sometimes in traditional disciplines such as painting or print media, and increasingly in newer areas such as animation. There is little in the way of formal training for this kind of artistic area, although some individual courses are offered at a handful of universities. An aspiring paleo artist would be expected to have a keen knowledge of anatomy, and an interest in staying up to date with new and revised information surrounding their subjects. One of the main distinctions between a paleo artist as a professional and an artist who is just passionately interested in prehistoric material is the recognition of a formal institution, most often seen in the guise of commissions. Building a client base and receiving commissions for work is a long and tedious process for all artists and is ongoing throughout their career. Finding a museum or publication that is prepared to pay for the art and associate their reputation with it is an integral step between amateur and professional artists. Another difficulty faced by any aspiring artist is developing a style that is recognisable as distinct from other practitioners. Therefore it is not uncommon for an artist to have a particular area of interest and focus. For example, one of the artists that work here at the National Dinosaur Museum, Eilish McMahon, is particularly drawn to theropods, especially those with crests. With a background in animation, her work employs a soft and playful sense of movement, celebrating colour and shape. McMahon uses patterns of lizards, mostly outback and birds, as a colour reference, 
often blending patterns together. While the type of art produced for a professional setting, such as publication, needs to adhere to a degree of realism and authentic representation, an artist, particularly those with an online community, is not restricted to solely scientific art. It is not uncommon for successful artists to produce work designed for differing audiences. John Conway, a prominent paleo artist who has co-written one of the most influential books on the subject, All Yesterdays, and spends a considerable amount of time researching for his art, is also a prolific producer of more inventive works. In his own words, I just paint things because I like the idea a lot of the time. One of the most interesting developments in paleo art, as indeed with many other areas, is the increased access to other artists in the growing international artistic community. With the advent of the internet, communication between artists, aspiring artists and researchers, the interest in paleo art and the availability of current information has become both easier and more important. The availability for the public to take both an interest and see themselves somewhat involved in the process of directing the creation of new content through social media and online forums has accelerated the production of newer artistic styles and themes. Celebrated artist, author and paleontologist Dr Mark Witten, who has been active in the scene for years and has a strong online presence, has reflected on the changes he's experienced in his time as a paleo artist. There's so much more discussion and interaction than there used to be. None of us really work in isolation anymore. Social media and the increase in online publishing have allowed people interested in paleo art, the artists themselves, their followers, paleontologists, to connect in a way we were unable to a decade or so ago. The future of paleo art is bright. Increasingly, it has found its place as both a respectable element of scientific efforts and as a respectable form of art on its own merit. Exhibitions of these kind have moved beyond natural history museums into formal art galleries and publications. This is the dignified point of departure before one meets the vibrant world of paleo-inspired fantasy and fiction, and the intersection between science and fiction here is one of the most enduring. It will be interesting to see how the growing accessibility of paleo art affects public knowledge and what new directions of study it inspires. The National Dinosaur Museum hopes you've enjoyed this episode of Echoes from the Eons, supported by the ACT government through the Where You Are Festival 2020, produced by Events ACT. This episode has been written by the National Dinosaur Museum, with thanks to Ailish McMahon and has been voiced by Samantha Chester. Check out our website or follow us on Facebook for more great content. Or better yet, come visit us at the museum.